Welcome to the Didi and Latal Show. Advice, thoughts, and stories from a married couple on cybersecurity, technology, and life in general. Now here are your hosts, Didi and Latal. Hello, and welcome to the Didi and Latal Show. Hey, Didi. Hey, Latal. You were very happy last night with uh, football back. Of course I'm happy with football back, because now we can... Uh, get back to non-communicating and watching sports and being ourselves the uh, it's nice to yeah I like kind of have you the, the doing bubble that. the bubble yeah. and also the there's so much to talk about like the fact that video review sucks and the fact that uh, I hate when they circumcise a mosquito about the size of the toe on the line uh, by the way uh, just for everybody's uh, uh, position yes he was outside yes if you can see it nobody it knows what you're talking about everybody. you know there is no context okay. and people listen to it like in random times they don't okay. know where well, well the context is the following <laughs> that's podcast you know people yeah. listen to it in random times they have no context to what happened to you last night so yesterday I was watching the Ravens <laughs> versus you. the Ravens versus Casey that's football Uh, or how we call it hand egg because it's not there's no fake feet or balls involved in the uh, in the sport and uh, Lamar Jackson was driving for the tie or the win uh, in the last two minutes of the game and uh, he threw to the back of the end zone and the guy caught it it was deemed a touchdown but video review showed that his toe was on On the line on the back of the end zone before that he also missed an open guy the same guy the back of the end zone uh, but and that's the thing that I really want to say is the fact that everybody's discussing the completed pass in the circumcised mosquito versus the fact that he missed the open guy for an easy throw so that's that uh, so football is back controversy is back do you Tom and I were arguing last night about the Is Dak supposed to be paid, not supposed to be paid? Dak Prescott is the quarterback for the Cowboys. And um, I'm always for the working man versus the man. So I'm, I'm for Dak getting paid. Kids are back in school. Kids are back in school. Life is Everybody's awesome. Everybody's in high school. Everybody's, Everybody's in, in high school. school. We are old farts. And the kids wake up later. Um, yes. High school starts at 9 a.m. It's amazing. Yes. Yes, it is. I can work out in the morning quietly before they wake up. Yes. So I don't need to take care of food stuff. It's funny, you know, that um, they said, well, our kids uh, take food, our food for school, leftovers. Uh, they don't eat school crap because it's really crap. But uh, it's very interesting because... Um, Our school decided to Man. not allow um, kids to doordash or Uber eats to school during lunch break so um, and probably they didn't tell the lunch catering company about it to rethink the logistics and the numbers and recalculate because what happened this week is that kids came to the cafeteria and they have like three different break three sessions and in the second out of third session the cafeteria ran out of food yep because so this kids is had to buy food in the cafeteria instead of uh, door dashing yeah this is my I think my door dash is going out of business I don't think like it's 4,000 kids that were door dashing every I, day I don't think it's door dash running out of business <laughs> I think this is where the parents need to, to step up and say enough with the stupid communism shit. Because the, the reason that they're not allowing DoorDash is not strangers. It's the stupid teachers' union against saying... I don't think it's stupid. It, it has nothing to do with the union. The reason is they actually don't want the kids to hang out with the phones. There is new phone um, rules now that the kids need to put it in a pouch that is locked for the entire day. They, they have all kinds of stuff. Communists. I don't know. <laughs> Communist. Stupid communists. They want <laughs> equality and, and they lack planning. And, and this is It's mostly lack of planning and lack of like oversight and the fact that kids don't like the food in the cafeteria. So parents have leftovers and send them with lunch boxes. 
Um, Our kids uh, are warming up in the morning, uh, last night's steaks, and taking it with some pasta, and that's the food for the day. I'm all for, uh, I'm all for the... Um, There is no equality, you know, because Newton North, our kids go to Newton South. Newton South is like in the middle of the burbs, and you don't have anything around it. That's and, not true. And no, it takes, y you need to drive to get no, something. No, it's not true. It is true because when you're in Newton North, you cross the street and you have a cafe, taqueria, um, and three you have pizza places and, and stuff. You have the, and you have the food court of the Wegmans in walking distance. It's 15 minutes walking distance. Yeah. Um, well, they don't have a break that long. Okay. If they have free class and those that have cars. Let's go back so to the, the Yeah, we're the already five minutes yeah. in. And uh, by, by, uh, back by uh, <laughs> demand. Popular demand. Popular demand is popular science. Yes. Oh, Didi and Lital making scientific uh, Massachusetts <laughs> comments yes. on things we heard um, around science. So kind of like our take of what's wrong with popular science, the way people Consume. see it. So the other day, I'm uh, while we're pedal boarding, I'm telling Didi, I'm kind of like half listening to podcast and something comes on NPR, which I still check from time to time, even though I, I moved to the center. Um, you moved to uh, the right. <laughs> Embrace the right. So... I still listen to it to know what's happening and uh, NPR is a get the facts of what people are consuming um, as the non-fact. Um, and there comes news about a new research uh, proving that um, addition of fluoride to drinking water causes decrease in IQ. And I'm like, what? Uh, no, and, you and, you were know, you first, were uh, no, I, I told you, <laughs> there are now claims that, you know, it's usually coming from the other side, uh, you know, you'll have the anti-vaxxers, anti-movement that is like on the other spectrum of uh, usually the political spectrum. Um, and then is all across the spectrum. Uh, yeah, it doesn't Stupidity matter. Stupidity non-science is um, everywhere. But, but it was like... Interesting, because typically that's not the type of uh, uh, news you're going to get there. So I was like, let's talk to Didi, the epidemiologist in the house, and see what he thinks. Um, of course, I, I had no clue about what is the research, what's the information. It was just headline. And I told Didi, NPR is claiming that there is a research about the link between lowering IQ and fluoride in the water and you need to know that um dd had some um dmd um uh, in part of your yep, yep. uh training uh, you actually um went to um, i started in dentistry and in, in, in i started my first uh, stint in medical school was in the dental school before, before you moved, moved and went to epidemiology yeah so you know a little bit about that so uh, let's start with like what's the knowledge and let's talk about Bed science. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so first, uh, I need to correct Lital because Lital came back and says he's always needing to correct. No, I'm I'm precise. I am very detailed oriented. Yeah. And I like to keep the details facts. So Lital comes and says, you know, it's very disruptive to system. Somebody added fluoride and it reduces IQ. So even Lital, the scientist believe that shit so before i didn't she, believe that yes yeah, she did uh, but it was just a headline in npl it doesn't matter she believed it and actually <laughs> thought it was right and that and that is i, I did say that in general i don't like intervention in big systems i i, I said i have no idea and that, that i don't know if it makes sense or not but i never like when you know you make you change um and it's an intervention intervention for life everybody's drinking water um that has long-term potential consequences that you never know what are they so i i never like it yes. um it's not the it has anything it doesn't have anything to do with you know is it true or not in general i think that you need to be suspicious on big interventions over a long time across multiple popula populations that you don't know what will happen. 
you said that it's not true because it's one of the most um, broadly researched topics. Area. Yes. So a- and so explain. What, so first, uh, I'll start by saying why I think this is complete bullshit. Uh, and this is something that you need to think of critical thinking and before this I'll, I'll tell a joke uh, it's a non funny joke but it kind of shows you the way I think and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's sad so Watson and Sherlock are camping and Sherlock k- kicks Watson and says Watson what are you seeing And he says, "I see stars." He says, "What does that tell you?" It means that we're seeing the universe. And how do you feel about this? I feel small compared to the universe, and I feel that the universe is so big and it's so immo- it's so impressive and so awesome and blah 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 and blah blah blah. And Watson says, "Sherlock, what does it tell you?" And he says, "Somebody stole our tent." And the <laughs> I only heard this joke a million a times a million times yes yes <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it's uh, the the joke is something about the way I think and the way I am I actually want to be Watson uh, I, I I'm Sherlock and most of the time <laughs> and I I'm like the the guy that says just the facts ma'am just the facts and I It's, it, it's, it's a problem. I, I, I view the, the hard, cold facts, and, and I can't see the cuteness. Sometimes designers like to show jokey things. I, I can't get what they're saying. And I can't see the, beautiful, the beauty of the universe like Watson can see. I see the stolen tent. <laughs> and, it's a, and it's a problem. And, uh, and from my perspective, when I was hearing this, all I heard was... stupid research and why was I l- looking at this and saying so you went and read the research I, itself, I, I, not the I, NPR summary I, of it. afterward afterwards I went and read the research specifically that NPR was talking about and then the, I found the meta analysis that was pointing to this research about its flaws but the second Lital was talking about IQ to fluoride yeah I we said, already could talk about uh, this said, makes no sense I, I said that that makes no sense and she said why and I said because one is a very measurable non-biased non-emotional non uh, very linear study you can put some you, me- you pick a glass in Newton and you measure how much fluoride was added to the water and you can also measure when was this added and how th- there's measures of To the hilt about this and the outcome needs to be related to a similar measurable outcome I'll give you uh, I'll give you something that would make sense if somebody had a hypothesis that it causes neural damage because IQ is supposedly related to neural damage right somebody should measure ele- uh, electric connectivity in mice give them fluoride measure electric connectivity and somebody did there's no no They, somebody should measure if it impacts myelinization of the nervous system myelinization is the like coating of uh, the n- neurons exactly if uh, for those that have some neural disease they, they have issues with the coat uh, which uh, makes their electrical current um, impaired yeah IQ is probably one of the most biased um, forms of scientific measure known to man there's about four and to five different studies some meet certain populations others meet other population there's also the interpretation bias it's a test it, it's it, basically a test that you administer and it's a relative it's a number rel- it's a relative to, number to the entire population, population. Um, so immediately we started talking not knowing anything about the actual research and uh, how they came to the conclusion of the Does it even make sense? Like, how can you take one thing? There is fluoride in the water for 30 years, 40 years, um, and, you know, uh, take a decision, <laughs> make a hypothesis. You can make an hypothesis, right, that it impacts IQ, yep. but it's almost, if you think about it, how would you measure it? Let's start with, like, um, how would you design a test? Um, 
it's impossible because if you think about it, there are so many other uh, criteria, uh, variables that impact IQ. Yep. Um, and are they talking about the same person? Are they talking about comparative um, populations? Um, no population on earth in one place versus another place is identical. They have a makeup that is different um, of people, of what the school system is, uh, what's the parenting style like, what's the uh, socioeconomical. Uh, IQ is one of those things that, you know, it's basically a test. And the results in a population vary so much depending on so many different criteria and you can say it's because of that or because of that and we're not going to get to that but it's it's a social talking about social con construct uh, yeah it is kind of a social construct, it is a social construct. That's, um, what, that's the part that i'm trying to say you're measuring a, a real non-biased the, the biggest problem with any study is biased you can't introduce a comparison of a biased measure with a non-biased measure you can do, you can measure IQ compared to social, uh, blah, 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 bullshit. So you're in a non-science comparing non-science. You can't do a science to a non-science. Because fluoride has a very clear indication, which is what I view as the benefit of it. There's a measure called DMF, damaged, missing, and fixed. Explain, and why are we, uh, what's the story about fluoride? Fluoride reduces dental decay. When you add and introduce fluoride, it replaces chlorine in the ML that is coating the teeth, and it makes the teeth more resilient to sugars and stickiness and the decay of sugar that allows... There is less bacterial film that is being uh, built on top of it. Exactly. And, and the film is actually built... Uh, they eat, they reproduce because you have sugars exactly. for them to feed on. Exactly. And because of that, because they can't latch on, they can't latch on, they can't create dental caries. The fact is that the index of called damaged, missing, and fixed index for teeth decay or tooth decay uh, depends on what state you're in, if you have multiple teeth or a single. And uh, the, the, the idea is that that measure, when fluoride is introduced into the water, drops significantly. It dropped so significantly that some of us actually attach it to the wave of obesity that's now happening. Because if you look at people our age that grew up in the US where fluoride was already introduced, um, I have about 16 fixed teeth, something like that, which basically uh, it means that I'm a mess. And I think you're even a bigger mess. And we grew up in Israel. We grew up in Israel. With did no we have fluoride in no, the water no, when we grew up? No, not when we grew up. When the, did they start? Uh, older generation. And by the way, that... Like in the, later in the 80s? Uh, yes, later in the 80s. So I think uh, your sister is basically a little bit of the cutoff age, but not in all municipalities. I think her teeth are better than mine. Yeah. Around I, I used to have a like, lot of issues, so cavities when I was a kid. Somewhere around your sister's age, uh, Lital's sister was born in the 82. Uh, 83. 83. So people at that age, there's like a big leap between these two generations in terms of dental health. And when fluoride was introduced, and it, it's true for everywhere in, everywhere in the world where it's introduced. So you're it, saying that it might have caused another problem yes. that kids can, you know, drink sh uh, Sugar sugary drinks, drinks. Get fat. And without getting the cavities that maybe have prevented them because yes. cavities are very painful and extremely costly to fix. Exactly. So maybe the parents would have thought of not giving them Sugar soda drinks. or so like the, so the frappem sugary cappuccino, whatever. And, and you can see how fast I can do non-science with, uh, with an actual <laughs> measurable because you can see that when DMF yeah, goes but, down, but obesity goes up and it's almost linear. And these are measurable numbers because what d you do is you compare a metric called BMI, which is dividing your health by your, your height by your weight and kind of giving an index. And if you're in the 40s, you have a problem. And that you can see that there's a, almost a direct link between the decline of, of uh, DMF 
and the, and the rise of uh, BMI. So I'm saying that if anybody wants to make any studies... Maybe we're supposed to not no, eat no. or drink sugary stuff. Maybe we're not supposed to, but, the, the, <laughs> but I'm saying that attaching a non-variable with a variable is a real, real problem, and people do this all the time. When people design a study, mm -hmm. you need to pre-study, pre outline why do you think the mechanic actually works. Because there's something called random fits. Everything you do when you measure, when you measure, uh, associate, there's something called association, something called correlation, and, once it, and another thing called causality. You can't actually prove causality. You can, at best... Unless you really, really understand the mechanism. Exactly. So uh, maybe we start with causality. Yep. Causality is when you know, you prove that A causes B because you see the mechanism. That's pretty rare in science, you especially in life, in life science. You never prove. It's uh, so hard to actually know. You have an hypothesis that A causes B, that consuming A causes B, but like, let's say we now know that you know some ingredients in um, cigarettes are causing cancer, the carcinogens. Uh, we, in some cases, we, we kn even know the mechanism. Yeah. I mean, you know that this ingredient may bind to a certain molecule in your body and and um, may be promoting some things that are related to cancerous behavior. But even then, we usually don't know the entire thing because the uh, cancer is a very, very complex disease yep. with multifactors. And we don't know like why person X can consume, you know, uh, smoke two packets of cigarettes a day and live to the age of 100. Um, well, most others um, smoking that amount will surely get cancer at a certain point. Uh, we don't know what point and what type of cancer. I mean, it's more common than others. So even with that, that so many research have been done, the exact causality, especially in life science, I mean, in, in some more exact sciences, the causality is a little bit clearer. Um, you cannot prove it. Yep. You still, you, the things you prove is the correlation and association. Yep. Okay. And when we think of as causation, I, I, I truly don't believe that we can prove causation. If you remember our previous podcast when we talked about hypotheses, mm -hmm. you can disprove an hypothesis. You can't By prove proving the opposite. Exactly. So You can say we believe that's the causation, but... Uh, but but we're can't, we can't... We can't... We, we say that there's a strong indication that this is the cause, or we cannot disprove that this is the cause. But you can... And you can say that there's a strong correlation, which is a linear association and proof of dependence, you have an independent variable and a dependent variable. And you, you, when you create that linkage, you're able to say, okay, I, I see the best, the best example of a dependent and independent variable is the ability to predict how tall a kid will be depending on his parents' height. It's a very strong predictor most of the time. Like the reason that Omri wakes up in the morning, looks in the mirror and says, I blame you me for marrying you for that's why it, that he's not six foot tall and he, he says that almost every morning but the, this is a very strong indication you take the, the the height of both parents the average height of both parents and you look at the predictor of the size of the the existing child and most of the time when you have a six foot when you have two parents that are six feet tall you'll have a child that's most likely taller than that. And even if you want an even better association, better predictor, you um, take the X-ray of uh, um, the, X -ray is the hand. And the X-ray of the hand is actually a stronger that's predictor. That's a stronger predictor. But, but when we talk about population predictor, now you can see the, the, the size of the parents. And by the way, this is also what prov proved what is called regression to the mean. Because eventually, if you have two very tall parents, like LeBron's kid, is shorter than he than he is because the fact is that at some point biology wins and you kind of regress back to the mean but the idea is that this shows that kind of a dependence and when you try to force variables that don't work in this equation to actually fall into this equation this is when things break because we like that association we like that simple story of i see x and it's related to y and we like to tell ourselves the story remember 
uh, uh, Dima's myth concept, mm-hmm. we tell ourselves stories. This Because it, the, of X, Y, y. happens. If we do that, and that will impact that. And we like linear relationship and, and that's and, how the, and most the human brain works yes, uh, and most we look for work, patterns and cause a, cause an effect and most of the world doesn't work that way <laughs> uh, n- almost none of the variables in the world are linear this is why you need to, to create logistical regressions and a way to create a linear effect from non-linear data and you need to show that that, that variables you need to do a lot of things to make the patterns actually work this way And when you measure a non-variable with a variable uh, or a non-dependent variable with a variable, life becomes I- I- full of these mythical things that happen. Like uh, if you wear a certain shirt, Tom Brady will win. N- no, these things have no effect on each other. Well, producer Dave, will, will they have effect on each other? That if I wear my lucky socks and shirt, will the... Will Brady win of course yeah the data of course proves. that's that's just good science right there <laughs> exactly <laughs> the data proves it the data proves it the, and this is the problem that, every time and, and this is the problem that humans see patterns assume patterns think about patterns and immediately uh, I- immediately create that linkage in their minds and once you it's actually reduced through the press to one-liners sometimes I've seen a case where the press takes the um, A comment so there's things that I've seen in the comment section of papers so for example I measure something when people comment of uh, what do you mean but the comment se- section of um, so scientific papers so I'll give you an example let's say I research the impact of vitamin E on strokes yep and um, I will have a side benefit reporting that some people men report that it gives them longer erections I, I will I will report it in the study if it's signif- if it's statistically significant I'll report it in the study even ha- though it's not your main even goal it, you it, just it's, put it's it not there. my main goal and there's no mechanism I, I will report this as a side effect sometimes you report the side effects of a drug study okay just so somebody else can take this up build the right study around it and And report on the right thing or somebody will run a meta-analysis and see we've run 50 studies this was observed in three out of 50 yeah. so it's a side effect that could be related to the population the, the drug that 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 and sometimes you'll see that that common section reporting uh, happens and so and the the news latches onto the common section the study was not built to research this This is a f- side effect of the study. No mechanism has been proven, <laughs> but the news will report it, and our moms will quote us us and say, "Oh, this is a fact." And I said, "No, it's not a fact. This was a side effect of a study that was not built to measure this population. And this is an important thing to know, because remember when we were talking about correlation, correlation is the strongest key in most life sciences. I have a dependent variable, I have an independent variable. I have what is called the correlation coefficient, how strong the, the link is. And there is something called a p-value. The p-value is how likely is this to actually be the case. And that p-value has been put at uh, 0.5%. It's basically how likely it is that you're completely wrong. wrong. Exactly. Um, how, how strong... Um, Uh, st- statistically how strong um, your claim is yeah. and, uh, and your proof exactly and this is one in 20 the rule yeah, 0.5 is exactly is, it's one in 20 one in 20 chances that it's you, wrong it's that, wrong that that's it's what wrong. that the linear correlation that you found is, is not uh, is not there but if you measure 20 variables you Then each one have uh, 0.5 exactly. and you multiply it and become and that becomes a bigger issue yes and most people don't know how to deal with the more complex math. multiple variable multiple multiple variable comparison the decrease of the likelihood so and most studies are not built to deal with this and when you they report that correlation they, they report it as we've made this observation but it does fall under the, the likelihood of being wrong So let's get back before we'll finish to what you read 
uh, around that specific research and what do you think was wrong there? So the study itself did not deal effectively with how to deal with the variance of IQ. IQ is a very complicated measure to measure. There's variations of study. There's not always a good fit for the measure to the population. Sometimes you compare, I measured IQ in one place with one study and measured another IQ in another region with another study. Or maybe I used a study that doesn't match the population because you need to have qualifying tests to see if the IQ test actually matches the population. Like to see if they speak the language, if they, they need to have forms, how, how, what's their literacy level. There's a whole bunch of these measures that you have to do to make sure that you're running the right test. Mm -hmm. And the meta-analysis that was run on a lot of the studies that had these IQ to fluoride relations showed that very much like my meta-analysis that I ran on the vitamin E, that people reported when they found the problem they didn't report when they didn't find the problem. So what's the story? I didn't read the... the, um, the you it, you it sent it to me and I, I didn't read it. In this was it that they did a meta-analysis no, of the, IQ the results in different places? No, this what was... Did a, this they do? The, what study I sent you was a specific study. The study was, was, that was quoted in the, in the paper. Yeah. Immediately when you look at, uh, at the, the literature index, there's something called NCB something, uh, and that already has a citation of a meta-analysis that proves that study to be wrong. So if you actually are a scientist and you look at this, there's been a, a later study that collected, a meta-analysis is a collection of multiple studies that adds all these studies up and gives back a, an indication of is this, are all these studies together better prove the point or not prove the point? And that meta-analysis actually showed that the numbers indicate a key lack of strength because it, it shows that there's missing data. There's like what is called the decline of strength towards the size of the study, which is usually an indication that the bigger the study, the more well-funded it is. It, it shows that the strength of the variable is weaker. And it means that the smaller studies got published because they were, ah, this is cool. So somebody published them. Of course. Or, they, mean, or they hit a nice nerve that somebody wanted to publish the paper on. We and talked already exactly. about, you know. Yeah, the, the publication the bias. Publication. Yeah. So it was very clear that there was publication bias there in the system. But also th when you look at the mechanics of the system, you see that the people that run the labs versus the people that run the IQ are not on the same page. It's something that comes, kind of comes up through when you read the study, because you can see that there's parts in the methodology section that just don't add up. And for me, the most important part of a study is not the results. It's, it's the, the study design? It's the study design the, the methodology. methodology. Is this study actually built to measure what it's built to measure? Because if it comes out, if it's not built to measure what it's built to measure, then you'll get fake results. This is, I think we're running out of time, so we'll do the NPS one it's, in, it's the, in, in the next No, it's discussion. really interesting. Um, I, I, I will end with that it, um, and give people maybe um, go read and think about it. Um, the FDA recently uh, rejected um, psychedelics as treatment um, for um, P PTSD. Yeah. Um, in, in mostly in soldiers. Uh, part of the reason was they came back and said, it's really interesting because that leads to the design. Um, they claimed that there could not be real double blinding, which means we talked about it, that you, the, the person that goes into the clinical trials, don't know if you get a real uh, drug or a placebo, and the one treating you and the one coding, everybody doesn't know who gets what, it's just facts. Yep. It took them, I think, more than seven years, I heard a podcast to design and get the FDA to approve the design of the test, because if you think about it, with psychedelics, the... Uh, a person knows that he's getting it. Yes. Uh, I mean, some actually thought they got placebo and still reported as if they got, but most of the people were right knowing if they got the treatment or got saline, I don't know, fake uh, sugar pill. Um, 
because of the, the strength of the psychedelic uh, treatment. Um, and that's, even though it was approved to begin with, um, at the end of the day, the FDA looked at the data and they said, no, the design was still false. Um, the results were really strong. But if you think about it, it's really hard to say if they were really strong because um, those people really believe that psychedelics are good for them. Many of uh, the participants in the clinical trials already tried on their own psychedelics and like were really advocates for that. And that's why they came to the, uh, they, they're also, I mean, there is this horrible thing that they're going through every day and then they really want this to be resolved. So there is also like the wishful thinking. Yep. Um, and I think there is because of the worry about side effects and circumstances of what this could end up with. Um, there's a lot of concern. Um, and, and of course, it's also a social thing. Do you go with those kind of uh, impactful um, drugs? But it's really interesting because it ended up a lot of people were like looking at it as political thing or like not a smart move or a good move or anti-veterans. And at the end of the day, it was really interesting. It's all about what you're talking about. It's about the design of a long-term study yep. and the fact that you really, really need to know the impact of it. So it, it's an interesting story. Follow up. I think there's going to be a lot of additional studies done because it seems to be effective. It's really interesting to, to hear uh, testimonies of people that have gone through the experience. I find it a fascinating area. Um, but at the end of the day, a study needs to be built in a way that it conforms with the way science has been doing. And some things are really hard. Yeah. Uh, with and, that. And, and, yeah. I'll, and I'll tell you that a lot of studies in the past that proved things that work, when you look at the flawed methodologies and the fact that they didn't work in hindsight, the methodology is the only thing that matters. Because we really want to believe when we see something working for a problem that's acute, we want to have something to blame. We want, uh, if, some, if something causes something, we want something to blame. And if something c cures, we want a fix. We want an easy fix. And sometimes there's no easy fix. And sometimes th there's, there's no way around it that you need to build the right methodology and you need to wait. And by the way, that is, I, I do want to link it back uh, the last two, three minutes to our line of work. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of cases where people build flawed designs and use numbers to beat each other over the head. Marketing all the time. We like have bad data and we make all kind of assumptions. Yes. <laughs> so this is the, based the, on that. Exactly. And, and I think this warrants a, a discussion on its own. Yes. Uh, about just the, the marketing data and the Ill, Ill use of marketing data or, or coding data, like uh, defects per line of the code, escaped defect velocity. Uh, a lot of these variables, people need to understand if you're using, uh, are you using the right metric? Do you even have the right sample size to even make any conclusion on? A startup doesn't have the data to actually say, well, I have insights of like how my funnel behaves and what's my customer behavior. There's a million things like you that. You need to be the size of a Procter & Gamble to really have understanding of consumer behavior. And Otherwise, you don't have sample size. Believe me, you, you, you to, don't have, you cannot be scientific about so it. So you need to actually define what is a, a, a relevant ver sample size yeah. to deal with the problem. So yeah. this is something that, and if you don't actually qualify the sample size required, you hear this a lot. Elections are coming, by the way, and those uh, and you'll see polls up the wazoo. Uh, and oh yeah, and nobody understands. And uh, nobody understands the 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 the, the, the p value rate, over the there. Value. Nobody understands the p value. Nobody understands the number needed to treat, and nobody needs the number needed to be polled to get. And what's the error variable? And um, this is a lot of the the stuff that people don't understand. You need to first understand what is the right population to create an effective prediction. And then you need to be able to know what's the error rate and what's the an acceptable error rate. And does the error rate mean that the whole number is wrong or what is 
the the range of things and wrong and in coding kids go take statistics class yes and mo- and by the way another thing that's really important when you think you know statistics be aware that the human brain is not built to deal with statistics absolutely not. most of the time it's counterintuitive it's counterintuitive and you'll measure wrong so be aware of that very few people have statistical inference built in with that with that we can conclude thank you so much well we hope you liked and uh, got enlightened a little bit write us if you like it the Didi and Lital show is a weekly podcast please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts write to Didi or to me on LinkedIn if you'd like to be on the show and uh, till next time see you see you bye bye